listen to uh, the recordings on YouTube, and you can go back and watch the classes that we're recording as well. So a lot of ways to get it in, and uh, it's not really getting it in here. It's getting it down into the heart. That's, uh, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, too, because not an easy subject and uh, not actually the easiest one to understand of all the ones that we cover. Uh, we decided to add an extra week, so we're going to have two more weeks after tonight. Uh, not next week because it's Thanksgiving week, so we're giving everybody the week off for next week. So um, I'll give you a, a little bit more that you could study while we're away for two weeks. But the last two classes for this semester will be the 3rd and the 10th of, of December. Then we'll take off for Christmas, and then we also decided we're going to do a part two in January. So uh, there'll be more, more of that uh, so you can apply this stuff. There's plenty more material, that's for sure. Um, is D. Henson nearby? Because I was told she's got a testimony. No? Okay. Well, that's her husband, so he would know. All right, so we'll get that next week then. Um, so you remember how we work this, right? You get to listen to a recording before the class, so you get familiar with it before we get together. Uh, you can also read the chapters in the book. So this week you would listen to the recording of Parental Inversion, which was put up on the web yesterday. Uh, the chapters are the last three chapters in the book um, that, that you can read. But I also have another uh, video I'd like you to watch by Danny Silk called Your Normal. So if you don't want to write down that web address, which I get why you wouldn't, we'll, we'll just send you the, uh, an email that's got this link in it, and we'll send you the slides from tonight too. So hopefully you're, you're putting a little time in during the week because it makes it so much easier to grasp the concepts and allow the Lord to to get it deep inside us. And then the prayer ministry at the end of each of these meetings has been very rich because once the Lord reveals something to you, you don't have to leave here and just walk out and say, now what? What do I do? Come up and get prayer. And, you know, especially tonight because, or, or really, I can't even say that. It's really been every week, right? Because forgiveness last week, uh, and not just forgiveness, but accomplishing forgiveness. How many recognize that there's a bunch of layers that you have to deal with when you're forgiving people, right? And you could think, ah, I forgave them, everything's good. And then you see them and you don't want to talk to them. So maybe there's another layer there that you have to forgive. Well, I'm not killing them, you know, I'm, I don't want to kill them. I just don't ever want to see them again. But I've forgiven them. <laughs> well, it might not be accomplished yet. You're on the way. But you're, you're about halfway there. You want to be able to bless them. You want to pray, God, give them a revival in their heart. It's got to be one of the hardest things for us is to forgive people that have hurt us. And, and that's something that happens with tonight's teaching, too, is that when you realize that you've formed bitter root judgments against people, there's usually a good reason that there's that bitter root judgment in there. They have done something to harm you. Performance orientation was that way, too, right? You, you, you realize that people were feeding you uh, a way of living that was based on fear. Anybody want to tell me what performance orientation is? you remember that? It's believing a lie that... Anybody? I'll only be loved if I perform well. Break that lie, okay? That could be the way this person is treating you. That's not the way God treats you. And it's really deeply embedded in our culture. And, you know, bitter roots and performance orientation are tied together. I'm going to try to link that a little bit for you tonight. Because um, once you understand how it got in you, it's much easier to uh, get rid of it. Uh, you've got to get to the source of why it's there. And, like, you're a young child and, you know, you're just listening to the people who have authority in your life, your parents or your coaches or teachers. And fear is an easy tactic if you're a teacher or a coach or a parent, to motivate people by fear. And that's why the Bible says God is fear. <laughs> what does it say? God. Okay, so good. Paid attention. I'm glad. That uh, you can either motivate people by fear, and it'll work for a while, but you'll burn them out. If you motivate them by love, if the reason that we want to serve the Lord is because we love him, and we want to please him, that we're not so worried that if we don't get it exactly right every single time, he's going to punish us. And some of us grew up in denominations that taught that, that God is angry. He's, he gets up angry, and he's angrier during the course of the day, and he just can't wait for you to make a mistake so he can hammer you. <laughs> well, it wasn't quite that bad, but it felt that way as a child, and uh, how the nuns treated some of us. <laughs> But anyway, I'm not trying to bash anybody. It's just that you could have had a picture painted in your mind that's not Abba Father. 
not loving Father, not that he's pleased to see me and he's perfect in all of his ways. So in, if, in any way that you still have that image of God as an angry punisher, you have to get rid of that. You have to flush that and say, no, that, that was a lie. I'm loved regardless of how I perform. Does he want me to perform? Well, yes, of course. Anybody who has children wants their children to flourish. But, you know, if you're teaching your child how to ride a bike and it's their first time and they fall, do you punish them? You spank the child for falling on the bike? How many of you fell the first time you rode a bike? Everybody in here, you ended up in the bushes. You didn't know how to use the brakes. And, you know, if you had a loving person, they weren't scolding you for that. They were saying, no, it's going to be okay. You'll get it. Try again. Try again. And let's work on this together. And that's how God is with us. The one who suffers when we don't get it right is us, not God. And he wants, to, he wants us to be together as a family, as a body of Christ, to encourage and uplift one another. Uh, just be careful about performance orientation. That's where I'm going to start tonight because there's a chart that's in the chapter that Cindy wasn't able to get to that I think is really valuable. And you have that now. So take a look at that. It's that circle that says the performance orientation slash depression cycle. And I'll tie that in with tonight's teaching on bitter root judgments. Okay, you see how it works? Uh, 12 o'clock, if it was a clock. That circle says, on top of the world. And part of you starts to wonder, is it really working? Even though things have been going good, the pattern in my life has been, as soon as things start going well, something bad starts to happen. And that could be because the person that you're working for, or the one you're seeking approval from, is taking that carrot you know, from the cartoon. You know, They dangle the carrot just outside the reach of the donkey. And the donkey keeps walking, thinking he's going to catch up to the carrot, and it's on a stick, so he never gets there. And if somebody's manipulating you, and they want you to keep working harder, they withhold approval, and they say, you did okay, but if you had performed a little better, things would be good. You did 10 things, and nine of them were good, but they bring up the, the one that you didn't do well. See, because if you had just tried hard, I thought you were serious, but you know, I guess you're not as serious as I thought you were. And there comes the shame, and there comes that decision, I better try harder. And boy, I'll tell you what, that's dangerous. So disillusionment, that's, that would be at 3 o'clock on this, if it was a clock, causes performance to wane because, oh, man, I thought I got there, but they're still not happy, so something's wrong. And, I, and the harder I try to work to earn love, it's not working. So what happens? I end up in the, following it? You end up in the black hole because... I did the best I could. I'm exhausted. I worked myself to death, and now I'm in this depression, uh, a, a hole of depression. And what do I think? Because this formula has been drilled into me. If I just if I work harder, if I do something, things will get better, and they start to get better. If you're in a, in a manipulation kind of situation, the person knows that if they just dangle that carrot back a little bit closer. Okay, here we go, things are getting better. So the more I work, the more they love me, and then I'm back on top of the world until the carrot gets put out a little further again. And, and it's never gonna work. You're not gonna perform your way out of it. And that, again, doesn't mean we don't have a spirit of excellence, but real excellence comes when you can be relaxed. And you can't be relaxed when you're afraid. If you've ever heard a singer, like, I don't know if you watch any of these shows where they're trying out people for singing, and uh, if they're nervous, it affects their voice because everything tightens up in here. But when you get somebody who's really confident and, and they, they're not as worried because whether they make it on this show or not is not going to affect their ability to sing. They're going to keep on singing. When they're confident and relaxed, all this is all relaxed in here, that sound just comes out beautifully. And that's true in anything. It doesn't mean you're not a little nervous when you're going to do anything for the Lord or for anything. You could be making a presentation at work, you have that little bit of like, I, I want to get this right, I want to impress them. But when you're confident in what you have, and, and you have that ability to be relaxed in that, that's when the best presentations come. Uh, so be careful. So it says right on here, if you, I'm not going to read that whole thing, just read what's on the slide if you would. It says the relig religious spirit drives Christians to quote unquote works in order to live up to the law. And it's a life filled with striving and guilt. When a church is infected with it, the body is condemned to live in fear of being cast out of the sight of God unless they can earn his love. So that's only one application. This could be a family situation. Um, it could be anyone that you're seeking approval from. If, they're, if they don't have a healthy base, if they're operating on bad fuel in their engine, then they're trying to get you to believe that I'm only going to love you if you perform well. 
It could be a husband with a wife, and the husband says, you know, if you gain five more pounds, I'm going to divorce you. That's real unconditional love, huh? And we're going to talk about a couple tonight in the example. If you listen to the uh, recording, you know, remember Bert and Martha? Anybody listen to it and, and hear about Bert and Martha? Yeah, we'll, we'll go back over that. There's so many ways that this could come out. Maybe you had three or four brothers and sisters in the family, and when the report cards came out, you know, one of your brothers or one of your sisters always got straight A's, and you were the one that was really trying hard, and you got C's. And, and mom and dad said, well, we're going to take the one who got the A's out to get ice cream, but you stay home and wash the floor, <laughs> right? Like, what would that do to you as, as the kid that got the C's? I'm going to try harder. I want mom's love. I'm going to study harder. See, it works in the short run sometimes until you break somebody, until you break them. And again, if you remember Jack Frost from the performance orientation recording, he had to be top hook. Remember, everything was about being top hook, and he was going to risk the lives of his men in order to catch enough fish so that when he pulled back in the dock, he could be the man. That's not God. Okay, that's not Jesus. See who he is? <laughs> Servant. Downward mobility. You want to be great in the kingdom of God? You serve. And if you never get rewarded for it in this, this life, you're going to get rewarded for it in the next life. And it's just so funny how God, you can't outgive him. So when you are giving him, he does bring rewards to you. As long as you're mature enough that it's not going to get to your head and you're not going to get inflated about it, right? So as long as you're doing it for the right motive, everything seems to work out well. Anybody see the movie Whiplash? It's about a drumming student in a uh, music school, like a Juilliard kind of, kind of class. It's, it's, I really can't, I can't even recommend it, you know, in, in a Christian environment because the language is bad. And uh, it's, a, it's a classic example, though, of, of a teacher using performance orientation to try to motivate the students. And he had this one, this is the teacher, and you could see these three steps he took. He started, he, he was talking to a drum student, and he wanted the, the student to hit the right beats. And when he does this, that means you're, you, you got it wrong. You're doing it wrong. And you can see the look on his face, right? Does he look happy? <laughs> it's this, it's kind of this scowl that happens when you're trying to do something right and the person that you're doing it for isn't happy. Is that an encouraging look that they're giving you or trying to cultivate fear in you that you better get this right or you're going to lose your scholarship? Could be your whole future on the line in your mind. I got into this school and I have to get A's. Well, they know that and they can leverage that against you. So what I wrote was a toxic culture of performance orientation can lead to bitter root judgments because you're never, you're never enough. And you get angry and you judge that person for never giving you the blessing, for never, for never complimenting you for, for the work that you're doing. And there's been many studies done about teaching styles and Many parents use a scolding kind of attempt to, to motivate their children to do better, and it's not the optimum way to do it. The optimum way is to act like a coach, to come alongside them and get in there with them and keep showing them the things they're doing right and not just the things they're only doing wrong. And, and that, so we have to even be very careful in, in our interactions with people saying, yeah, you did okay, but you could have done better. Then you start building this negative view in their mind about it, like maybe, maybe I'm just never going to make it. And you don't want that kind of self-talk going on in the mind of your child. And I just put three words here, like the first picture, he's loathing. Like, I wanted you to do it right, and here you go, stop. You screwed up again. See, we don't want to do that to people. Disgust, I mean, we know what that feels like when somebody's disgusted with you. And then the last version is contempt, where they... Uh, they have, they, they've bankrupted your value. You have zero value. The Italians would say, you're dead to me. <laughs> zero value. Come on, Mandy, get up on the mic. That's fine. No, no, that's why we have the mic there. I don't know if it's on. Just, just see if you could flick that, that on. Balance. Is there because, balance? Yeah, because I saw a documentary on Vince Lombardi. Mm -hmm. So he would ride his players all day. But then if he saw one falling by the wayside and, you know, uh, disgust because he wasn't treated right, right, he would walk up to them and say, you're going to be the best lineman ever. And that would motivate right. them to, to get better. As a business owner, you know, I have to do the same thing with my right. employees. So is there a balance? Of course. It has to be a balance. Yeah, we're only talking about the toxic effects 
and we're only talking about performance orientation as a negative, right? We're not talking about, I'm, I'm the head of the worship team at this church. I have been since we started 20 years ago. Uh, somebody tries out, and then we have the auditions, and, but they're not really ready. They're not, they, they haven't reached a talent level, but I don't want to hurt their feelings, so I let them come up here. That's not, that's not helping anybody. There's a certain minimum level of skill that you need to, to obtain before you can get on the team. Or it might not even be a matter of skill. It could be that they're not teachable. And I've been on many teams like that over the years. It's like 40 years now I've been playing in bands. And musicians can be some of the most high-strung, you know, difficult people to work with. So it's not just your skill on the instrument. It's whether you're easy to work with or not. And whether you're cooperating or in, in our style of worship, there might be time that there's free flow and you have to defer to the leader. And you want to go off on your own little thing and, you know, you're off the reservation. <laughs> And it's pretty hard in the middle of a worship set to go over and pull the guy's plug out while he's playing. I've wanted to do that a few times. So it's, it's back to whether you're going to encourage people and, and get them to operate out of a love. You know, there's a great saying, when you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. <laughs> right? It is. It's true. When you have a passion about something, and you can tell, Michael Jordan, he loved playing basketball. We have a drummer on Sunday mornings, Sebastian. I've never turned and looked at him, and he wasn't smiling while he's playing. He loves it, and it comes out in the, in the sound. And, and like he's always looking at me. Sometimes uh, I'll have to turn and look to give him a signal, and he's like dead on. First of all, he's so good he doesn't have to look at what he's doing. So he, he's watching me because he wants to know if we're going to go in a different direction. It's, it's a beautiful thing because he loves it. He started when he was four years old. Been playing in church. Everybody in their family started when they were four years old in church. It's a beautiful thing. So anyway, this is this is something we really have to guard against because you could be the person who's the coach, and you could easily slip into using fear to motivate people because it works. It works in the short run. Shame is a really good motivator in the short run. It's unbelievably damaging in the long run, and it creates layers of resentment in the heart of the person that you're trying to uh, work with or who you're trying to get them to work with you. And I'd just be honest, you know, the, uh, when you plan a church, there's way more needs than there are people willing to do the needs, right? So we need a lot of help. And we just, you know, Trish and I had been through all this material before we ever came out here in 1999. Uh, she was basically doing this full time, just counseling people in our last church, had her own office and you know, like she was busy because there's a lot of hurting people. And we were like, you know what? We're not going to try to build a big church uh, and do it on the back of the volunteers. We would rather go slower and healthy than try to race to have the biggest choir, the biggest children's ministry, and the biggest this and the biggest that. Because I'm not burning people out along the way. They're God's kids. And, and using manipulation and fear in a church environment has got to be one of the biggest contradictions ever. If ever there's a place that should be healthy growth and encouraging and not using fear to motivate people, it should be in God's house. Yeah. And yes, I'm, I'm, like I said, you, know, you have to have your balance. You have to draw the line on what your standard is. And as long as you're making it clear, if they can't meet the standard, it doesn't mean they're bad people and they don't you know, kick them out of the church. But it's like you show them the, the biblical example of, of excellence that Jesus gave us and Paul gave us and so many people gave us. All right, so let's just go to the next one. Here's, a, here's an example. I call it head trash or self-talk, some people would say, in this scenario with this teacher uh, who's in this picture. I hate this teacher. Why do I hate him? Because it feels like he hates me. And saying I hate somebody over and over in your mind is not good seed going in the soil of your heart, is it? That's a bitter root. See, that's, that's developing something that now I know tomorrow when I come in, I'm expecting to be shamed again. And in this particular movie, man, it's scary how good this actor portrays the psychopath teacher. How about, he's going to pay for the way he treats me and shames me, right? I'm going to get back at him. I don't know what I'm going to do yet, but I'm going to get back at him. He's going to pay for this someday. That's a form of a bitter root getting started in your heart. That's vengeance. And what does the Bible say about vengeance? It's mine, says the Lord. He'll never be satisfied no matter how hard I try. I think that's true. It's true to you because you've been shamed and you don't want to keep having to try, so you just start to unplug. That's what Jack Frost did, remember? 
Again, if you listen to it, you heard him. There was a day that he reached his brother, was such a better tennis player than he was, that he dropped the, the tennis racket, walked off the court, and said, I stopped being my father's son that day. Yeah, very deep and profound. So the fear and the discouragement only works to a breaking point, and then once the breaking point hits, that's it. I'll ne he'll never be satisfied no matter how, try how hard I try. I will always mess up at this same point in the song, so then what happens? I expect to mess up when I get to that point in the song. So I get nervous because instead of encouraging me about the things I've been doing right, he only points out my flaws. Selah, right? If you have children especially, be careful. I'll lose my scholarship. I'll get kicked out of school. I have no future. I'm a failure. I'm a loser. Fill in the blanks some of the things people say to themselves about themselves. So you might have a bitter root judgment against yourself that has to be broken. You might be believing a lie about you that's making it hard for the love of God to come in and penetrate. And you can forgive yourself. You know that, right? If, if, you've, if you've created a judgment against yourself, it's, it's based on the lie that you're no good. And that's not what God says about you. So you may have to forgive yourself. Uh, I'll never amount to anything. Here's one that kind of makes it real for us that it's easy to fall into our flesh. <laughs> In Luke chapter 9, verse 52, it says, They entered a village of the Samaritans, but they did not receive him. When the disciple James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? <laughs> Remember this? So they're quoting the Bible, right? Like, hey, it worked once before. Please, these people don't deserve you, Lord. Let's just nuke them. See how easy it is to go there when somebody mistreats you? Like, you could feel so justified to call down fire from heaven on these people. But wait a minute, what if that were you? What about cutting people some slack? What about 1 Corinthians 13, 7 that says, love believes the best? We talked about that a couple weeks ago, remember? Like, do you believe people are trying the best they can? And some of you kind of, I don't know, sure doesn't seem like they are some of the time. But it might be because there's just so much pain in their life that, You've learned to expect them to act well in certain areas, and then this one area, they just seem to keep falling short. But they, there might just be a blockage in them that's stopping them. So we said the best thing to assume is they are trying to do the best. They can live your life as if they are trying, and, and don't jump to a conclusion, because you can't walk in their shoes. You don't know what they've been through. And they haven't walked in yours either, right? And nobody gets a free pass in life. So... How, how life dealt them a bad hand, you might have handled it differently. So just be careful about judging, because that's clearly what happened here. They were ready to call down fire on these people. <laughs> the, the, the verdict was in, guilty, nuke them. <laughs> call down fire. It's pretty severe. Verse 55, I just love this. It's so important to remember. Jesus turned to them and rebuked them and said, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of. The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, come on, to but to save them. So we're going to talk about that tonight because the way you interact with people, you'll, you'll see that they've got bitter roots. And now that you know this information, it's not just for you. It's to help you help them get rid of that stuff, to cleanse out that tank of the poison that's on the inside of them. And you can do that many times by loving. And, and just listening and letting them get the stuff out and, and talk about it a little bit. You know, often it's, it's things that happen when they were children and they were shamed about things. They've, they've done studies on this now. There's many more studies out, uh, just secular things, where people that wanted to, um, well, uh, creativity shut down. So when you're a child in kindergarten and the teacher gives you a piece of paper and crayons, it's no big deal, right? You could do a blue giraffe if you want. Nobody cares. Then all of a sudden, the, the talent starts showing first, second, third grade now. Kids are getting much better, the ones that are gifted at it. And the other ones, you know, not so gifted at it. And, and the teachers, if they're not careful, can shame the kid and hold up somebody else's picture and go, look at what Johnny did. You, know, you really have to be careful because then that kid might have had a gift in there. It just hasn't blossomed yet, and they could be shut down. And there's adult children that are going to... Uh, college and and part of the application is they want you to draw a picture of yourself and in one case that I remember hearing about because it's so stuck with me the, the guy had great grades and everything he threw the pencil down and walked out 
he got so triggered by having to draw something. He had been shamed so much as a kid about his drawing that that shut him down, and he just had to walk out. He had straight A's and everything else. So you never know how deep it goes. And you know what I mean when I say get triggered, right? So uh, let's be careful about that. All right, and then in Romans 14, verse 10, it says, Why do you judge your brother? <laughs> Why do you think we do? You, know, you ever hear the misery loves company idea? So let's just say you feel bad about yourself in a certain area. You're, you're struggling with your weight. And you look at other people and you make fun of their weight. And, and typically when you hear people criticize other people, often it's because they're struggling with that same thing. So you want to feel better about yourself by putting them down. Wow. Not good, right? Very unhealthy. So why do you judge your brother? Well, sometimes it's because we want to feel better about ourselves in a really sick kind of twisted way. This should not be true for Christians. But if we're not applying the truth of the word, like we're going to learn about tonight, you can fall into that thing. And you can start gossiping about people and, and, and talking behind their back in a way that makes you feel better if you could somehow bring them down. Not what God wants us to do, okay? And then he says, well, why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So I guess if we could just level the playing field here for a minute, right? Uh, the, the wonderful thing about the body of Christ is it's this, it's this great equalizer. And if you ever are on a worship team and you're standing up here in the front and you're watching on a Sunday morning with everybody's hands lifted and they don't necessarily know who the people are standing next to them, but there's this amazing uh, mixture of people. And it could be, you know... Uh, an investment banker from Wall Street in one seat and, and a doctor and a plumber and a mechanic. And it could be a guy that just got out of Market Street Mission who, you know, needed a ride here today. And God doesn't look at any of that. What's he looking at? Heart. Boom, right? And this guy, remember the tax collector and the, uh, the two guys that were praying and the Pharisee that was praying? And the Pharisee said, oh, I'm sure glad I'm not like this low life. Remember? It's right in the Bible. See how easy it is to feel good about yourself by putting somebody else down. And Jesus said, no, it was, it was the sinner that walked away justified because our pride knocks us down. So he, he's not looking at your resume and your bank account and the kind of car you drive. He's looking at the condition of your heart. And many times, those of us that have been through tough times and addictions, we get humbled by those things. And that's what this is saying. Don't show contempt for your brother. We're all going to stand before the Lord. Every knee is going to bow to me and every tongue is going to confess. And we're going to be responsible for the way we treated other people. God created us in his image. He wants us to love what he loves. What does he love? People. <laughs> There's the answer. We're made in his image. I'm sure he loves the deer and the mountains and all that too. But they're not made in his image. We are. <laughs> so we're supposed to love what he loves. And judging people is not loving them. It's really hard to love them if you judge them. Right? Now, it doesn't mean you don't need judgment, because here comes Manny again. But I have to make judgments on my job, because he's right. You do. It's not saying you don't have discernment. I'm not, I'm not anticipating that's your question, but, but people do ask this all the time. Like, well, what do you mean? I can't just let people roll over me and never, never challenge them. You do need discernment, right? But, but when we're talking about judging, here, judging we're saying you're, you're bankrupting their stock price. Their value goes to zero in your eyes. Right? When does God ever do that? Never. Is there ever a time that he would say, you're irredeemable? Thank you, Jesus, that you wouldn't. So we can't do that. So example, before you go, Manny, you're driving down the road, and somebody pulls up, and you know them, and you go to lean over into their car, and as you lean into the window, you smell alcohol on their breath. So you know they're driving while under the influence. And you grab the keys out of the car and you pull them away and say, you, you're, you're taking Uber. You're, you're taking... Did you judge them? You might have. If you said, you lowlife, I can't believe you're risking people's lives by driving this car like this. That's where you cross the line. You discerned the situation, but you didn't bankrupt their value. Because God doesn't do that to you. And as soon as you say, you'll never change, you've just taken God out of the picture. And you become the judge and the jury because you changed. 
So you can't say they'll never change. It might be the 400th time you're having the same argument, or at least it feels that way. See, that's why it's called an expectancy, too. If you read about it, there's expectancies and there's judgments here. But go ahead, Mandy. What's your question? And that's exactly what I was going to hit on. I've Ex known you a long time, man. Expectations. Yes. So when I find myself in an area where I'm judging in that manner. Right. And we all do it, so don't stare at me. That's right. <laughs> Stop looking at him like that. It's usually because the person that I'm trusting in has not met my expectations. There you go, man. You're hitting it big and, time. And I think the frustration in me comes out because now I'm responsible to pick up that load. Right. And it becomes more unbearable as time goes by. Can't you all relate exactly what he's talking about? And that's why you would go to say they're not really doing their best. I can't act like they're doing their best because that wasn't their best, except you don't know why they let you down. And it could be because of something in their heart that they don't believe in themselves. So here's the thing. The Bible says that Jesus never sinned, but that he was angry. And then there's another verse that says, be angry and sin not. So you can confront people in a loving way. You could speak the truth, do it in love, and still be firm. You're the boss. Ever had to fire somebody? Yes. Of course you have. Can you do that in love? Yes. Is it easy? No. no. <laughs> not easy. It's like, but you're really doing that person a favor because they're not flourishing here. And as long as you can look yourself in the mirror and say, I exhausted the options here. Come on, you can come back. It reminds back. me of that saying, this is going to hurt me more, more than, than hurt you. More than hurt you. Yeah, like, right. I believe that for three seconds. Because <laughs> that's your father telling you right before he hits you, this really hurts me more than you. Like, no way, you big liar. <laughs> Figuratively, it hurts me. <laughs> so look, this is deep stuff. Because relationships is the currency of, of the kingdom, and, and changed lives is the currency of the kingdom. And, and the world uses force against force, right? So when Jesus said, turn the other cheek, it's, it's not so much literally that you turn the other cheek. It's that you pause and you give that person a break before you try to rip their head off, right? And, you know, I'm looking at Dan, like we work in New York City at a very, very competitive world of Wall Street. And, like, you don't get an inch of space. Like, you got to bring your A game every day. They come from all over the world, Asia, everywhere. You know, they're mathematicians. They, they graduated college when they were 15, these kind of people. Like, you ask a question, they've got five steps ahead of you already. It's a little intimidating sometimes. But they got problems too, right? And like, so you just have to be a little bit, you want to be on your toes, but you don't want to be so ready to attack that you don't, you're not present to the moment. You have to be present to the moment because the Lord will give you a way to get in behind the walls that they've erected and, and allow you to bring change into their lives because many of them are working off of these judgments. So I'm going to keep going. Verse, verse 12 says, so then let each of us, I'm sorry, so then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. So that's the thing. I like to use that expression. Have I exhausted all the options in trying to work with this person? And if the answer is yes, then it's time to move on, right? And, but that's a pretty big word, exhausted all the options. And let's just get real for a minute and talk about marriage. Because where did this expression come from, opposites attract? Does that sound like a contradiction? Like a Why would opposites attract? Well, if you ever know me and my wife, we are opposites, and we're still together 34 years later. Thank you. She was cheering for me there because she knew. <laughs> no, just kidding. That's a judgment. Just kidding. <laughs> so, look, here's the deal. I, I met her, and I was really taken by how confident she was and how much she loved the Lord. And I had more of a pliable kind of just easygoing, you know, nice guys finish last. And she was the opposite of that. She was like right up in your face. And I really admired that. She was bringing something that I, wasn't, I had the middle linebacker part of my life. I knew how to be violent when I needed to be in football, but I was too soft in certain ways. And there was a part of her that, that showed me something that I, I really admired. And similarly, there was you know, uh, things that I had that she didn't have that you, you feel like you can complement each other until you get in your first fight. <laughs> then you're not so happy she's so tough. Right? It was great in the deliverance session, man. She was casting those demons out. But now all of a sudden, man, she's mad at me. So you have this balance that you're trying to work through, right? But then you, here's this key prayer. Lord, 
show me what you see when you look at Trish. Because part of you gets frustrated that, why don't you just do it the way I do it? Because I have it all together. If you were just more like me. <laughs> touching a nerve there, huh? Okay. First aid kit, third row. <laughs> because you got it. You know, that part of your temperament is, is real together. So just, uh, you know, an example there is that she's very prophetic, right? So she tends to think out into the future. And I was drilled, you know, much more about the list and scheduling and timing and organization. So, like, we want to leave at 7, okay? <laughs> not, not a good issue there. It's, it's going to be when, when we're ready to leave, that's when we're going to leave. Part of me was too hung up about having to be on time. Because we'd get there on time and no one else would be there. <laughs> it's like, I was the only one worried about it to begin with. So I realized, hey, wait a minute, this is on me too. Like, I'm taking it too far and being, like, you know, obsessive about it. So she, uh, we both had to meet each other where we were at and realize that there was redemptive qualities even though it was different. But you could judge somebody, right? You could judge him for what Manny said. Like, you know, you're, you're letting me down because you're not on time, and it's really important to me that we be on time. And I am, I'm not saying that it's not important. It is important to be on time. If you, if you say something, you should be true to your word. But not, not if it's a party. That, you know, who cares what time you get there, right? But just have to be careful. I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on examples because it's the principle that matters. And this is really key. It says, therefore, let no one judge one another anymore but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. So that could be where you're pulling rank on them. So if you have a certain skill set, you're very organized, and you're with somebody who's not very organized, you could keep mocking them. Like, I could have done that with one hand tied behind my back. Well, you know, maybe in that case it's true, but there's 10 things they could do better than you that just aren't on the table right now. And you don't want them pulling rank on you, right? Because it's not a contest. And I heard this really good line, it's like especially in marriage, but any relationship, really. You don't want to win in the relationship because then you're with somebody who lost. <laughs> you're living with somebody who lost. And that's the worst possible scenario because they don't feel like they can ever get ahead. And you could give up your right to be right without being a weakling. Because I want my wife to flourish in all areas. Is everybody good at everything? No, of course not. So what am I going to do? Focus on the thing that I think she should be doing better in or build her up in the things that she's good at and come alongside her and help her in the things that she's not so good at and vice versa. Because there's, there's clearly both on both sides. And once you see that, like we're allies. We're not adversaries. It's not 50-50. And you, got, you dropped to 49. You better pull your load. How do you think that would work with Trish, by the way? <laughs> it's great. It's a great way to live. So it's, it's not 50-50. What is it? 100-100. <laughs> way better. And your 100 in certain areas is going to be better than the other person's 100, right? And that's why you're together, so that you can fill in those gaps. But the other thing that's so beautiful about it is she looks at life through a different lens than I do, and I might be just ready to pull the trigger on somebody, and she's like, no, I, I'm really not getting, uh, I don't think we should do that yet. Let's wait a little bit longer, because, you know, she's great at praying and listening and hearing the Lord. And, the, and the other, it's happened the other way, too, where I'm like, no, nah, you know, look at it this way. And she's like, oh, I didn't think of it that way. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? But why wouldn't that be with all relationships? It's not the same as a husband and wife, but it's true of all relationships. Everybody has value to God. And when you judge them in a way where you devalue them, that's where the problem comes in. And that's part of what Jesus meant when he said, don't call a person a fool or raka. You don't have the right. You're not the judge in this situation. You might like what they did, but you don't have the right to take down their value because he doesn't. Okay, good. Glad you're agreeing. So where, this, um, where the phrase bitter root judgment comes from is Hebrews chapter 12. This is one of the core verses in, in this teaching. It says in 1214, pursue peace with all people. Can we just stop there for a second? How hard is that? The guy that just cut you off on Route 3 by the Lincoln Tunnel. You're pursuing him, but it's not in peace. 
It's called road rage. <laughs> do you have a question, by the way? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't mean to ignore you. You can ask it. So do you remember that part where you said, have you exhausted all? Yeah. Does that apply to parents? No. Like... <laughs> That's another teaching. That's next semester in January. Honor your mother and father. <laughs> it's a hard one. No, I, I, I can't say no ever. Just, you know, it would depend on the situation. But you really want, if, if, if you're going to cut anybody slack, it's your parents. And that's what it says right in there. It's the first commandment with a condition, with a promise on it. Honor your mother and father that life may go well with you. Now, kids, you know, kids get slack. You know, adults you have expectations. Your sure. parents, it's like, you should know this. You know what I mean? You That's didn't walk my in their issue shoes. right now, so it's kind of like, how did you teach it to me and now you're not doing it? Well, you know? Just take the robe off for a minute. So. And don't be Judge Judy. I'm just trying to figure out, like, when it comes to these bitter roots, yep. I forgave. Why is it times where it's just overwhelming? It's probably better if we just talk about it one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. But it's a great question. Look, this is a really tough one, isn't it? It doesn't say honor your mother and father when they're honorable. Right. <laughs> it just says honor them so that life may go well with you. So the easy conclusion is in those areas that you don't honor them, life is not going to go well with you. So, and look, they, they didn't live perfect lives. And when you hear the Jack Frost story, it's really easy to judge his father, isn't it? Until you hear how he lived. And he was an orphan in a small town, and he was rejected everywhere he went. He wasn't even allowed to go f visit a friend's house because everybody in the small town knew that he was an orphan. So he was rejected from the time he was a little kid. So what did he do? His formula in his brain was, I can outperform people, and that's when they'll cheer for me. So he became the best athlete, and he was driven to do that for the wrong reason because he was performing to earn love. So in his mind, he goes in the military, perfect, right? Like that's performance. And then he comes out and these kids are gonna learn that you can only win in life if you perform better. Well, that doesn't work for everybody, does it? Because there's only one person who wins. And what about it's how you play the game? <laughs> it is how you play the game too. Get it? Okay, so I don't mean to dismiss your question. It's probably just better to drill down you know, more in prayer and one-on-one, -on -one, but it's a very important point. And you can say, well, what if my parents are gone? What if, what, what if they died and I never reconciled with them? You could still honor them. You, know, you could still honor their memory. And that's what's so beautiful about this. Pursue peace with all people. That's such an action statement, isn't it? Pursue, it's like a uh, Matt Damon movie, man. <laughs> I'm supposed to pursue it. I'm supposed to chase it down and pursue peace with them and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. So it's not just you that gets defiled when you're holding on to this bitter root. It's concentric circles of the people around you that are close to you because it tilts your decisions. And it tilts what you tell your kids how they should handle other people in the family at the wedding. We don't talk to them. I mean, there's some Italian weddings that takes eight hours to figure out the seating arrangement because of who talks to who. And nobody even, I'm Italian. That's why I'm saying Italian, okay? I'm not, you know, I'm saying it about my own family. Is that like nobody remembers what the fight was about? It was 40 years ago. They're still holding that grudge. How good is it? All right, Romans 12, 18. If it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. So look, if pursue peace wasn't good enough, here it is. If possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably. That means I can only handle my half of the equation. If I've got a problem with somebody else and I've tried everything I can to work that out, then I could still just say, Lord, show me what's the next thing you want me to do. Even though they're totally rejecting me, they won't return my phone calls, they change their phone number. You know, however they're rejecting your attempt, sometimes the attempt alone is enough to, to break it down because they're, they can't hold on forever. They're realizing, man, I can't keep holding on to say I got to just... Let's just talk and clear the air and, and, get, and move forward. Let's call a truce and let's just move forward. Because, you know, it's very, very stressful to, to not be in right relationship with people, especially because of how God wired us. And then he says in 19, do not avenge yourselves, 
Bitter judgment in some way is a form of trying to avenge yourself, so be careful about that, but rather give place to wrath, for it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. This could be at work. I, I find this a lot, that there's lots of drama on the job. Anybody with drama on the job? <laughs> lots of hands going up very quickly. Didn't take long. And you get into a problem with somebody, and the justice part of you wants to report them to human resources. <laughs> or the other thing is, I'm going to send an email, and it's going to be all caps. <laughs> you know what that means. You're shouting in the email, right? So we've really, a long time here, we've been telling people, 24-hour rule. You can write the email, but don't hit send. And it's amazing the next day when you go in and you look at what you wrote the day before, after you've had a night to sleep on, I go, oh, my God. I'm so glad I go to that church and they told me not to hit send. Because <laughs> you end up making the problem worse, because now whatever the original problem was, the new problem is your email. See what happens? This is a total attack of the, de of the devil, and he gets you hijacked. He, he hijacks your emotions, and when you do things out of that emotional place, bad problem, isn't it? Okay, so that's what he said. Don't avenge yourselves. And I'm not saying that certain things on the job shouldn't be reported, but pray. Make sure you're hearing the Lord about whether you're doing the right thing or not. Because if it is a big problem, you're not the only person who's facing this issue. Okay, so you might not have to be the one that calls it out, but maybe you are the one. So I'm not saying ignore it. Just don't let your emotions be the thing that rules it. Let it be the Lord because you pray. Yes. How are we doing on time here? I got a look. Eight, Eight. Okay. The law of judgment applies not only to our conscious actions, known and performed outwardly, but also to what is lodged in our heart and repressed, unknown and unexpressed. So that's a tricky one. Because I can't think of anything, of any reason why I would be having this bitter root. Well, you know, things happen to you as a child that you don't remember, but they're still lodged in there. And if you had a father who was promising you to come to the game, let's say, and didn't come to the game, you start to get this expectancy, like, I, I hope he doesn't even tell me he's coming because I get so disappointed when he doesn't come. Right? That's lodged in the heart, and it's unexpressed, and it's my, many times just forgotten. And the forgotten part could be that it hurts too much to try to remember it. And in this class, sometimes memories will come up that you would almost like try to block it and say, oh, man, you know, I want, I want to be whole, but it hurts too much to remember how I was treated or remember what that thing was that I was going through. And, and that's why the prayer is so important at the end and why you have to picture Jesus going back into that place with you and walking through it with you because it's real. The pain is real. What, what happened to you was very hurtful. But if you just let it stay in there, it's just going to keep percolating more poison. That's, like you said, it's not expressed and known in our conscious mind, but it's in there. And it says, once formed, the judgments bring results. Bitter roots that are not brought to the cross will defile you and many others. Bitter roots may be the most powerful negative force in our lives, bringing destruction to us and those around us. Now, that's written by the Sanfords, who counseled for 40 years. Right? So of all the topics that you know, we cover, they're saying this could be one of the most toxic things. And partly it's because it's hidden. And, and we just ask you a general question. Like, is there ever a time that you're angry and you don't feel justified to be angry? <laughs> right? Of course you feel justified. I have a reason to be upset. Well, I, of course you do. You don't just make it up because you've got nothing better to do and you're bored. I think I'll be mad at somebody. It's just, are you going to allow that thing to hijack your emotions? Or are you going to try to rule your spirit, right? Because it says in Proverbs that a man who doesn't rule his spirit is like a city with the walls broken down, which means you're open to attack. All right, so this is why another really important reason we've got to get to the roots. For us, roots are habitual ways that we drink nurture from God, others, ourselves, and, and nature. Now, that's a really kind of very Sanford kind of statement to make. Drinking nurture. When you think about a plant in the natural the plant sinks down roots because it's pulling up the water, that, you know, that capillary action that comes from the water underneath the ground, and it feeds this thing. So something's feeding us, and if it's bitter root, then it's that negative memory that we're holding on to that might not even be in our conscious mind, but it's that low self-image that we have. It's that, you know, we had a friend whose father was an alcoholic and called him stupid his whole life. You know, that was like the joke of the family. Meanwhile, you know, the guy went on to be very successful. He clearly was not stupid. 
But because the father had a problem with alcohol, he would just keep repeating this over and over. And of course, as a kid, it's your father. He's got a, an authoritative voice. And you're going to believe what he says. You start to believe that lie, right? So be careful that you got to forgive him, right? Because if, in that case, if that little boy judged his father, I hate him when he does that. Well, what, what law did he violate? Honor your mother and father that life may go well with you. Did he have a reason? Yes. Was it still a sin? Yes. Anybody want to leave at this point? Because really, no, it does. It feels really unfair that that would be the case, right? Like that little kid didn't know any better. But, but now that the Holy Spirit is in your life and you're a Christian, you have to take the next step and say, well, now that I know this, even though I don't think he was doing his best and he could have done a way better job, I have to do what they told me and believe that there was some pain in his life that caused that behavior, and I'm going to repent for the sin of judging my father. Very hard to do, but so important. Can't even tell you how important it is. Sometimes with the Word of God, you just have to do it out of obedience. And there's just some amazing cleansing thing that happens. Over the years now, 20, 20 years we've been doing this. I can't tell you how many times people did this kind of mechanically, even angry with us, because we would say, okay, we'll help you pray. Just repeat after me. And when they got to the part about I forgive them, they were like choking on the words because it's just hard to do. It's, you feel like you're letting them off the hook. And they owe me, and they owe me an apology. I shouldn't have to apologize. And that's true, they do. But you can't let that shut you down. And, and especially with parents, but it's not just parents, right? It could be a lot of other people that you were counting on. You know, the point that Manny said, I was counting on you and you let me down. Yep, and have you let anybody down in your life? You know, hopefully not intentionally, but yes, of course we have, right? So in, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Judge not, lest ye be judged, and the same measure you mete out will be meted back to you, <laughs> measured back to you. So that's that sowing and reaping process, right? If you want to be forgiven, you have to forgive. The key for us when we first saw this material was that we didn't recognize that we had sinned by judging our parents or anybody in authority over us because it felt like we were justified to make that judgment. But especially with parents, because it's not conditional, you have to break, uh, you have to ask the Lord to forgive you of the sin of judging them and that it's amazing. It just frees up all kinds of baggage in your life. All right? So that says we drink nurture from God and from nature and from others. And, and you think about that. It's a pretty profound thought. Like we're wired to be together. And you want to be surrounded with life-giving relationships, right? That's, that's, what, that's the richness of life. And, and when they put you in jail, the way they punish you more than just being in jail is to put you in isolation. And the devil knows that in the, in the kingdom of God, one puts 1,000 to flight, but two, what? Put 10,000 to flight. So there's this multiplication factor that when we're together, as opposed to when we're alone, we don't lose our perspective so quickly because we have somebody else there to pick us up when we fall, right? Another verse. Not good for a man to be alone. Two are better than one. You hear that at a wedding all the time, right? So what are we drinking our nurture from? It's God, nature, and others. He uses those as examples. The Word of God, the Holy Spirit, worship, music. Be careful what you're feeding yourself and let it be redemptive. Let it be life-giving as opposed to being around very negative, toxic, you know, uh, criticizing people and, and environments. And if your work environment is like that, you don't have to give in to it. Right. You don't have to let that negative influence you. You can be a light in the midst of that darkness. I'm not saying that's easy. Trisha has an amazing testimony of how when she went to work at... Uh, a certain part of the airline that she was working in, everybody was nasty, cursing, fighting, drugs, fist fighting. The girls were fist fighting. And by the time she left, everybody but two people had gotten saved. Yeah, so, but, so you have to be intentional about saying, I'm going to be a light in the midst of this darkness. All right, then it says, our roots also lie beneath the surface, usually hidden to the adult mind. When we have bitter roots, we drink harm to ourselves. So the thing feeding me is the lie that I believed when I was a kid. And if you're not sure about this, there's usually some kind of fruit, right? Uh, I talked about it, rageaholic, uh, somebody on the car, road rage. That's fruit. That's not having the peace of Christ ruling and reigning in your heart. You're like a hair trigger. Somebody cuts you off. You feel the need that you have to go cut them back off. Like, no, we're adults now. Like, that guy is having a bad day. Let him go. 
It's not worth it. Not worth it. There's sinful reactions to hurt, condemning judgments of other people, right? These are, these are what it looks like in the fruit. You have a sinful reaction when you get hurt as opposed to forgiving the person. You are condemning of other people and you judge them. You refuse or you're unable to forgive someone. And you hear this a lot. You know, I could never forgive them for what they did to me. Well, that's not a Christian saying, is it? No. And, and who's getting hurt by you not forgiving them? It's not the other person. They're sleeping fine at night. <laughs> You're the one that's, you know, going over and over in your mind about it. And these bitter roots are powered by a, an unchangeable law of God, which is sowing and reaping, right? Whatever we sow, we're going to reap it, good or bad. So there's another picture on the back of that uh, performance orientation. Let's just look at that real quick. I got that coming up here, but I, I'm, I want to budget my time well. And uh, this is exactly what, what we just talked about, sowing and me reaping. It says, mankind sinning is like a man who throws a ball against the wall. At some point, it will return to him. And then Galatians, it says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. The longer our sin goes unrepented, the larger it grows. And then in Hosea 8, 7, it says, they sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. So it's a law of multiplication. Now, it doesn't just work with sin. It works with blessing too, right? If you sow a small blessing, you reap a big blessing back. If you sow a judgment and you sow a sin and it, gets, and it goes undealt with, it comes back bigger. So it starts out small, young Joe, and it's, you see by the time it comes back, it's bigger. It says, uh, I'm sorry, by the time our sin returns to be reaped, it's grown to overwhelming proportions and James 1.15 says, Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. So that same guy, 25 years later, is getting hit with this much bigger return. God, will un I'm sorry, God, unwilling that any should perish, sent Jesus to identify with us in all our sinfulness. Jesus took our sin upon himself and died with it for us. <laughs> Our sin was canceled, and the law of sowing and reaping was fulfilled in him. Do you not think that I came to abolish the law? I didn't come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. And I love this picture on the bottom, because that's the difference maker, is the cross stands between us and that sin. Okay? And it, he took the reaping of the sin that we deserved on, on the cross with him. And so we're called to take hold of life that Jesus won for us by his death and resurrection, and to walk daily in a disciplined a discipline described for us in Scripture. So um, I, I always found that really helpful. The longer you let it go, the harder it's going to be to deal with it. So better to put it all on the table now as quickly as you can as the Lord reveals things to you. And look, let's just say you prayed and you said, Lord, I'm willing to let you show me whatever you need to show me. Is he going to dump the whole thing out on you all at once? No. no he, he loves you too much to do that. You wouldn't do that to your children if you love them. You're gonna, he's going to let you start seeing things that you can get some wins and, and, and see some results because then you'll be encouraged. And once you are encouraged, and I'm guessing some of you already are, just being in the class for the four weeks so far, you've already seen some progress. That's why you keep coming back because there's something to this. And, and it's true. There really is. There's something to it. Um, all right. So um, then let's go to expectancies because Manny already touched on that. And that's the, uh, a different slide. Can you find that one? Maris, it was right after uh, Roots, I mentioned Roots. It says they have the power to defile many at the top. Here it is. Okay, yeah, just go down a little further. It says they infect our minds with expectancies. And this is really big in marriage, right? Because when you're dating, you're kind of putting on your best front. After the honeymoon's over, you're living together every day. And it's like, you're not hiding anything anymore. And you start to see patterns developing in your spouse. And you start saying, like, but you never take the garbage out. Or you always leave the cap of the toothpaste off. I'm using really, like, lame examples here because it gets much more severe than this, doesn't it? And now all of a sudden, it's like, I'm not even thinking they have the capacity to do what I need them to do. I don't even expect them to do what I need them to do because they have blown me off 
um, what I'm telling them that I need. Is that true? No, it's not true. Not, it might be, but don't assume it's true. Assume that you've become adversaries instead of allies. You don't want to win because if you win, the other person feels like they lost and then you're living with a loser. Not a good idea, okay? So expectancies typically forming before the bitter root judgment takes root. It's like a tent gets set up, but once the bitter root judgment is in, it's like cement has hardened now and the judgment's there. So be really careful about always and never. Right? You don't want to say that about your spouse or anybody who's important because that means you've already decided what they're going to do in advance. And, that, and you t again, you've taken God out of the formula. He could change anybody's heart, but he needs you to be on the right side of this and not to just automatically assume, like, you're never going to do that. It's been 50 times I've asked you to do it, and you never do it, so why should I think you're going to do it now? But God, <laughs> how about that? Thank God. Yeah, thank God. That's right. So here comes, you know... These expectancies are habits of self-fulfilling prophecy by which we push people to fulfill our picture of the way things will go. Man, that's a big one. Women will always be critical. Men can't be depended on. No one ever listens to me. See, this is the big lie that keeps getting repeated in our heart. That was an expectancy that turns into a judgment. So do you mind if we just go through Bert and Martha for a minute? All right. This is not really Bert and Martha. These are just two people I found on the internet. They don't, we don't know who Bert and Martha are. But let's just read it together. If You, ha you have it on your handout, okay? It says, uh, Peter Richards was at the top. Bert and Martha came to me, John, for ministry. Bert thought the problem was pure and simple. Martha was too fat, and he couldn't stand it. Is the problem ever pure and simple? No. no. Okay? The, the fruit of the, of the negative part of the relationship, he wasn't happy with her weight, Okay? That it's not that pu pure and simple. Martha felt awful about herself, but claimed it wouldn't be so hard to get the fat off if Bert would just quit criticizing her all the time. A few minutes of questioning revealed some root causes. Bert had grown up with a mother who not only became obese, but was also slovenly. She failed to care for her appearance. The house was poorly kept. She would use the toilet with the door open and the children running in and out. Bert judged his mother for her appearance and habits, okay? Did he have a right to do that? Was there a reason to come to that conclusion? Yes, but was it still a sin? <clears throat> Seems so unfair. The devil's, a, 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 is, you know, he, he's a liar. He's a cheat. When sin entered into the world, these are the rules of engagement. Once he judged his mother, he committed a sin. His bitter root judgment and consequent expectancy was that his wife would become obese and slovenly. See what happens? Because he judges mother, the very thing that he hated, he, he set a force in motion to repeat it happening again. You believe this? I'm getting some quizzical looks. Okay. Martha had grown up with a father who she could never please, no matter how much she tried. He always found something to criticize. At least that was her perception. Whether her father was actually that critical was not what was important to me, John is saying as a prayer minister. What was crucial was that she had judged her father. Since she could not honor her father in that area, life would not go well for her in all similar aspects of life. Her bitter root judgment and expectancy was that the man of her life would always be critical of her. Hmm. So Bert judged his mother and expected his wife to become obese. She came into the marriage expecting that the man would always be critical of her. See how it's a perfect match of a disaster? <laughs> now, you're going to listen to this this week, this, this uh, video I, I mentioned about Danny Silk, about Your Normal, it's called. And you'll just see this exact scenario playing out again. And, and actually, you could say it's a good thing that God puts us together with somebody who's willing to expose this stuff in us. Right? And they say, perfectly designed to grind. When you're single, it never would have come up on the surface. But now all of a sudden that you two become one, your stuff is going to float up to the surface too. And now it's up to us to deal with it. All right? So she, she expected that the man would be critical and that she would never be acceptable or be pleasing to her husband because her father was never pleased. See, there's the train wreck 
It's about to happen. So when Bert and Martha met, Martha was a slim, beautiful girl. They fell in love and married. Later, Martha became pregnant, and as she grew in size, so did Bert's difficulty to appreciate and compliment her. After delivery of the baby, it took a while to, for her to lose the weight, and Bert became increasingly upset and critical. But now he was sure he had married someone like his mother. <laughs> He's expecting it because he wasn't encouraging her. The more he criticized her, the more she gained weight. And now it was fulfilling that lie. See, I knew I was right. See, I knew you had no discipline. And meanwhile, she's like, see, I knew I was right. All you're going to do is criticize me no matter how hard I try. Train wreck. He found himself increasingly critical and scolding. But that, of course, is what Martha was already expecting what would happen. Under attack, she became agitated and insecure, so she ate more for comfort and grew heavier. As Bert became angrier and more critical, she became more upset, more nervous, hungrier, and fatter. All of this affected her ability to keep herself and the house neat. Their judgments and reactions spun to more and more painful levels until at last she was living with an angry demon and he was living with an obese wife. What created such a destructive spiral? It wasn't just the expectancy. It's true that he expected his wife to come, become fat and she expected to be criticized. But that expectancy by itself doesn't have enough power to overcome their attempts to try to lose weight. See, that's, he's trying to draw the line between the tent that gets set up and the cement that forms when we create a judgment. When it's just an expectancy, you can still deal with it. Well, you can still deal with it as a judgment too, but it's easier in the expectancy stage. They had already seen what they were doing to each other before they came to us for prayer. And they were Holy Spirit-filled Christians, so they had decided they wanted to do something. about it. They set their will to do something about it. They came because they found themselves powerless to stop. They needed help. They didn't, bottom line is, they didn't realize they had to repent of the sin of judging their parents. Let the light go off right now for you. Like, think about it. Maybe you did. Like, chances are good that you did. And it just never was surfaced like this before. All right, so I only have a couple more, and then we're going to pray at the end. But I just want to make uh, a few points before, uh, before we finish this. The last thing I want to do is discourage anybody about these things, because the good news is there's an amazing power in the prayer to ask for forgiveness. What we, what, we lack, what we lacked anyway, me personally, I didn't recognize that it was a sin. And, of course, that's just what the devil would want. But it's not just your parents, right? It's other people. It's coaches. Like for me, I played football, right? And you're not going to get all good coaches. My son, you know, when he was uh, playing, one of the coaches walked by another player. I was sitting in the stands, and uh, the coach walked by another player who was sitting there, and, si and this kid was sitting on the bench with his leg up because he had hurt his ankle. And the coach looked at him with just disgust on his face and said, you're on the bench again? He goes, if you were a horse, I'd shoot you. I mean, can you imagine? If that was my kid he was talking to, over the fence, right there on the spot. Say what? You do what? <laughs> and you're a coach, right? Like they have a massive impact. Teachers have a massive impact shaming people if, if they're not careful, right? So it's all around us because there's unhealthy behavior all around us because hurt people do what? Hurt, hurt people. people, right? So you know, don't be one of them. Be one that brings resolution and reconciliation. So if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, which is a really big study, I'm not going to try to tackle it, but it goes from Matthew chapter 5 through 6, and it ends in chapter 7. And, and it's considered the greatest teaching of all time, even by non-Christians, to talk about ethics. The golden rule is in there. There's so many amazing things that mankind has benefited from, whether they believe in Christ or not. There's just a lot of truth in there. But as you walk through 5 and 6 and you get to 7, he's starting to wind it up at 7. And, you know, at the very end he says, uh, you could be like a man who builds his house on the rock or you could be like the man who builds his house on the sinking sand. And the one who hears what I say and does it is the one who built his house on the rock. When the storm comes and the winds blow, the house stands. So that's what we're doing now. We're trying to separate the sand and, and the rock, right, what we're standing on. So right at the beginning of 7 is when he says this portion that we're going to read right now. Judge not that you be not judged. 
For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So if we're going to just be kind here for a minute, we say, we're going to make mistakes. How many parents are in the room? Okay. Have you been a perfect parent? Okay. Were your parents perfect? Do you think when your children are parents, they're going to be perfect? No. So you see why it's nice to cut some slack to people? Because if you're judging your parents, then your kids are looking at you and going, yeah, but you're falling short too, so who are you to judge them, right? So we just want to give people a little bit of grace here and say, yeah, it sure didn't seem like you did your best, but I don't know the pain you went through. So I don't know how you arrived at where you were. I'm going to believe the best and think that you were trying your best. And, and, and because of that, I'm not going to hold a grudge that you didn't give me what I needed. And especially as a Christian now, we should be seeking from the Lord what we need. And including in our marriage, like if you're totally relying on your spouse to satisfy all your needs, you're missing God, right? You, you would want to hope that they love God more than you, right? Because if they love God more than you, then you can count on them making really good decisions. And, and yes, we do need each other. We do support one another. We're trying to uplift one another. But I'm not going to be able to be perfect at that. But if I'm, my main source is the Lord, then I can handle if it's not perfect with my spouse. Okay, with me? Okay. So for, well, verse 1 and 2 is very profound. That's sowing and reaping. The measure you use to judge others is the, me is the measure that's going to be coming back to you. Whatever you sow, you reap. If you sow grace, you're going to reap some grace back. And you still can be firm without judging people. Verse 3. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't consider the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye? or your husband, or your wife, or your boss, or whoever you're dealing with here, right? Well, let's start with ourselves first, is what Jesus is saying. Be careful that you don't nominate yourself as the sheriff who's arresting everybody for bad behavior. And then you're the judge, and you're putting him in jail. Oh, wait. Start with yourself. Don't. How do you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and you got a plank in yours? Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So when people are emotionally unhealthy, they will feel jealous of you sometimes, right? And that's not being arrogant or prideful. It's just this rule I mentioned earlier. They call it zero-sum game. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Ever hear that expression? So you remember when you were in school and the smart kid would come up to you at lunch and say, what'd you get on, on the test? Did they really want to know what you got on the test? They wanted you to then say, well, what did you get, Judy? <laughs> Sorry if anybody's named Judy here. See, they were never asking because they cared about you. They were trying to get you. They were fishing for a compliment. So what did you do when you found out they got a 99.9? .9? You had to knock them back down to zero. So you had to think of something to criticize them for to get them off their high horse. You see, that's a zero-sum game. No matter what you say that's good, they're going to try to put something else out there to knock you back down to level. That's not healthy. You should celebrate that they got a 99.9. .9. Good for you. How'd you do in the game on Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Not so good. <laughs> Maybe they're a scholar athlete. Who knows? Maybe they did good everywhere. But the point is, like, you shouldn't feel better about yourself because you have to knock somebody else down. Celebrate their their victory with them. <laughs> All right. So only a couple more. It says, God has written balance and retribution into the universe. Because we have, we have all made judgments and we're due to reap, we draw to ourselves those people who are best designed to deliver that reaping. That's a hard statement, isn't it? <laughs> Unless you're courageous enough to say that's actually a good thing. <clears throat> I needed somebody in my life to help uncover stuff that I wasn't dealing with on my own. So even though it hurts to go through the process, I'm going to be better on the other side. Um, I'll just give you a, a small example that relates to a topic that we're going to cover the next week, the next time we get together. Um, and it's called parental inversion. So this happens to people who've been traumatized as children in their family have been asked to do more than a child should be asked to do. And they take on too much responsibility at a young age. And it's really hard for them to get free of that as they get older. And that, that was the case for one of the people in our church who we loved and who was with us for a long time. 
and it was a woman in this case, and, and the light went off, and, and she realized, and it, it really hit her hard when she realized that she was in that role, and things that had been suppressed for a long time, and, you know, uh, because she was used to being such a doer all the time, her family got used to her mowing the lawn. Imagine mowing the lawn and, and the clothes and everything. Always a list. And, when, and when, when this thing hit her and she realized that she didn't have to be the one to do all that, she, she had a period where she was like, oh my God, I can't believe what I did. And the husband called me and said, what did you do to my wife? She doesn't want to mow the lawn anymore. <laughs> no, but he, he, it was just an initial reaction. Like he realized later that this is the best thing that ever happened in their marriage because the upside was he didn't have to mow the lawn. The downside was he could never relax because she always had a list of stuff that he had to do. And no matter how much he did, there was another thing to do. And she had to recognize that's not a good way to live your life. So even though it was painful to, to recognize the problem, Getting rid of it was a hundred times better because now they finally, and this is exactly the quote was, we finally are living together at peace and enjoying the ride. And with parental inversion, you know, people have a really hard time relaxing and enjoying the ride because they got so used to normal being a crisis that if they're not in a crisis, they have to create one. Yeah, I mean, that's a little bit oversimplified of a complicated problem but there's freedom for it. That's what I want to get across. All right, it's 827. Let's go to the prayer. We'll send you out the slides. I saw a lot of you taking pictures, but we'll, we'll just send you the slides. And then if, if you're on the prayer ministry team, if you could come up, we'd appreciate that. I uh, want to remind you that it costs money to oper operate this building, so if you don't mind making a donation, we would appreciate that. I'm never good at about asking for uh, asking for offerings, but um, it does help. So if if that's uh, on your heart, I just got a thumbs up for that. Thanks, Deb. And um, you could just drop it in these baskets on the altar in, in your time. But um, I would like to read this um, prayer together. And if if you're on the prayer ministry team, come on up. So this is a good thing to hold on to. Yeah, you can stand. This, this piece of paper, you can reuse it, right? So you don't have to fill in, um, <clears throat> you don't have to fill in names on this sheet. This is my recommendation anyway. Keep this as your master. I'll, I'll just give you my own experience. So when I was growing up, there were people in my life that were really, uh, putting heavy weights on me like this that I had judged. And the Lord revealed them to me through the course of my weeks and months and, you know, through my life. I'd be driving and all of a sudden another member would come up and I would just pull over and write it down and say, okay, I got to pray through that one. So there's, there's a lot of blanks on here. See it? How this prayer works? And then you could just have a separate piece of paper and write Ralph, okay? So I... I, re I recognize that I have a bitter root against Ralph, so these are the things I'm going to repent for with that person because there's likely going to be more than one. You with me? Okay, so I don't have to say too much out loud right now, but right on that first line, if we all just could honestly say we probably judge our mother and father for something, right? So you could just say that today, and, and, and then as we go through it, you'll, you'll understand what they're, what they're trying to get done here, okay? So it says, a prayer for bitter roots. Let's read it out loud together. Lord, I recognize I have judged my father for fill in the blank in your own life. And I've locked myself into that same behavior attitude. I choose to forgive him for hurting me. And I choose to release my right to hold this offense against him knowing that it's up to you only to judge all of us. Please forgive me for the sinful ways I've reacted and for the ways in which I have done the very same thing to others. No, that could take a little time to remember, okay? But you end up becoming the very thing you judged. That's the sowing and reaping part. So you want to repent for that, okay? Next paragraph. Lord Jesus, forgive me for judging my father. Now I see I am reaping the same pattern throughout my life. I choose to forgive 
and release my anger and bitterness to you, Lord. Please remove it from my heart. Forgive me also for my part in tempting them to do the very thing I hated by the power of my expectancies. Woo. So the first paragraph, we're asking the Lord to forgive us for judging. The second paragraph, we're forgiving the person who did it to us. Now we say it. I forgive you. This would be the counselor speaking now, not the counselee, right? So you receive the forgiveness now. Let's do it as a group, and I'll just say it. I forgive you, and as a servant of Jesus Christ, I say to you that as you have forgiven those who wounded you, so also has the Lord forgiven you. Lord, I ask you to break each judgment that has been named and remove it from this person's life. I ask you to consume the reaping of all the years of sowing destruction. Replace it with your blessing. And I ask you to bring experiences into this person's life as evidence that these judgments are no longer operating. Strengthen him in his inner man or her to be able to practice new responses and continue to bring awareness of any other judgments in the perfection of your timing, Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, I'll just give you two testimonies real quickly. There's plenty, plenty more that we could give you. And we were, um, when we first started the church, people were coming here from the Market Street Mission. That's why I mentioned it. You could say stand, and it'll be quick. And one guy came, and he hadn't talked to, do you remember how long it was? How, you know, was that, I think it was seven years he hadn't talked to his mother. He heard the class just like you just heard it now, and he's going, this sounds like a bunch of hooey to me. <laughs> he goes, how could me just saying some prayer create a change? So, well, we said, well, what's the harm? Just pray the prayer. The next day, she called him for the first time in seven years. Now, you might think that's a coincidence. I don't think it's a coincidence. There's something going on in the spirit that God's just waiting for you to take the first step. And I won't even go into other examples. There's been so many, it's hard to remember them all, of physical healings that have happened to people when they release that, that bitter root out of their lives. Things that have been held back in their own physical development shifted and changed because you have that much power with your words that once it gets free, you get free. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, I finished my 8.30, so that's like um, amazing. <laughs> 8.33. And uh, you don't have to clap for me. I'm just doing what's expected. <laughs> for those of you that want prayer, you can just come up that aisle, and we'll, we'll get you to a team. And I just want to pray for those who are leaving just to bless you, okay? Can you lift your hands? Lord, we just hold our hands up like a big funnel, and we just ask you to pour your power down in through our lives because we're not able to do this without you, without your help, without your power. Holy Spirit, we invite you to reveal things to us that have been hidden in our lives. If there's layers that we bury things under in your perfect timing, like we just prayed, please bring it to the surface and reveal it in your timing, in your sensitivity, in, in the way that you love us because we want to be purified vessels. We want to be people who contain your glory. And if there's anything in there that's holding us back, Lord, we want to purge it out of our systems and not poison ourselves with unforgiveness or bitterness in our hearts. So thank you for revelation. Thank you for the upcoming season of, of Thanksgiving that we have coming up and that we can apply these things over the next two weeks before we get back together. And, and Holy Spirit, we just invite you and welcome you to come in and give us all the instruction that you have for us, and a heart to receive it, ears and eyes to receive what you want to show us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, she's loud, isn't she? <clears throat> Bless you guys. Have an awesome night, and I uh, will see you in two weeks.